How's it going everyone? The Salamander Man here, and this video is going to discuss the importance of breeding your newt or salamander in our hobby, and also some tips and tricks that we can use to determine the sex of your newt or salamander. So first, we will discuss the importance of breeding. In my previous videos, you may have heard me stress the importance of breeding your captive newts or salamanders. Breeding is absolutely critical in our hobby. And perhaps one of the biggest reasons is because it helps to prevent the need for capturing local populations for profit. Every hobby starts somewhere, but at this point, if we are able to, we need to keep our hobby going by breeding our own animals so that way we do not damage local populations. I am often asked the question, where can I purchase a newt or salamander? When you compare our hobby with other hobbies, such as bearded dragons, ball pythons, geckos, and turtles, our hobby is not as popular as the others. And perhaps it is due to how difficult it is to not only keep our animals, but also to breed some of them. Especially when you have to determine the complexities of the species of newt or salamander that you are keeping, and the complexity and expenses of the enclosure that you keep your animal in. And not only that, but also when you consider the lack of information when it comes to not only keeping some of these newts or salamanders, but especially when it comes to breeding them. It is not always easy to obtain a newt or salamander, especially one that is captive bred. You can easily do a Google search to figure out where you can purchase a salamander, and what you will notice is that there is a pattern. You will often see many similar species across different sites for sale, such as eastern newts or spotted salamanders, marbled salamanders, or northern red salamanders. And from what I've noticed, these are all salamanders which are not commonly captive bred, some being easier to breed than others, but the young also being difficult to raise. Eastern newts are not a difficult newt to breed, however, they are not a beginner animal to keep due to the complexity of this species. From the gilled aquatic larva to the terrestrial red eft to the aquatic adult, they are very complex and there are many factors to determine when keeping a species such as the eastern newt. The aquatic adult may be easier to keep, however, the extremely small size of the eft when they emerge onto land for the very first time from water makes them a very difficult species to keep, especially when you consider the food that they need to survive. That said, they also take many years to mature. In the wild, the red eft stage of the eastern newt can take up to four or even six years depending on the population to fully mature. So when you consider this, you can clearly see how over-collecting can damage a population. Other species such as the spotted salamander and marbled salamander are much more complex in achieving successful breeding. In the wild, spotted salamanders participate in a massive amphibian annual migration to their breeding sites. This migration is brought on by the perfect recipe of warming late winter temperatures and rain under the cover of night. Throughout the entire year, the spotted salamander remains terrestrial up until this breeding event, where they will enter the water to breed and then lay their eggs. And being able to simulate this complex process for the spotted salamander in captivity is no easy feat. So it is easy to see why many newts and salamanders are often collected in the wild. So this all seems to be a good recipe for a bad practice of collecting local populations for a profit. However, with effort, research, and dedication, proper care and breeding can be achieved with either of these species. Another reason why captive breeding is so important is because captive breeding also helps with conservation efforts. As we participate in captive breeding, we are actually assisting with the continued existence of a species. There are many endangered or threatened species in the wild who have benefited from captive breeding. Take for example the axolotl. In the wild, the 
axolotl is nearly extinct. Its conservation status is currently critically endangered. In captivity, however, axolotls are one of the most widely bred species in the world and often used for research in laboratories. It is fair to note, however, that axolotls in captivity differ greatly from those in the wild in terms of genetics due to inbreeding and crossbreeding with tiger salamanders. Other species, such as the Kaiser Newt from Iran, have also benefited greatly from captive breeding. So with all this information at hand, we can clearly see the benefits of captive breeding from our hobby to wild animals as well. So how do we actually go about breeding our newts or salamanders? One of the most important things that you can do is to first properly identify the species that you have in captivity. Each newt and salamander species has its own unique courtship and breeding process, so thorough research is always required. However, there are a few general rules of thumb that we can use to make breeding much more achievable. Of course, the first thing that we need to make sure of is that we have a male and female newt or salamander. Now this may seem obvious, however, it is not always easy to differentiate between the male and female outside of breeding season in some species. So let's break down some things that we can do in order to differentiate between the male and female in some of the more common species that are kept. One thing that we can use to be able to distinguish a male newt or salamander from a female, depending on the species that you keep, is the cloaca. The cloaca is the enlarged area right underneath the beginning of the tail near the hind legs. In some species, the male's cloaca is usually much more pronounced than the female's and this is especially obvious during breeding season. Some species where the cloaca can be a good indicator include the eastern newt once it is fully mature, the spotted salamander, Chinese firebelly newts, crested newts, just to name a few. So, even though the cloaca can be used as an indicator to distinguish between the male and female in some species, Outside of breeding season, this may not always be a good indicator. However, depending on the species that you have, there are a few signs that we can use to tell the difference. As an example, the Easter Newt has wider hind legs than the female, and also during breeding season, the male is adorned with black pads right around the cloaca and the hind legs, which are used for gripping the female during amplexus. The Spanish rib newt also has a few differences that we can use to distinguish between the male and female since the cloaca is not a good indicator in this species. The male's body is much more slender than the female's and the tail is also proportionately longer than the female's as well. Also, the male is adorned with black pads which are also used for amplexus in this species. There are other signs that we can use as well. The female will usually have a much more plump and rounded body as opposed to the male's slender body, and the female is usually much larger than the male as well. So, these were just a few examples and ideas that we could use in order to distinguish the male from the female newt or salamander that you may have. As always, each species is unique so thorough research is always needed. Now that we've gone over how we can try to distinguish the male from the female that we may have, how do we actually get our newt or salamander to breed? The other part of the equation when it comes to getting our newts or salamanders to breed is winter cooling. Winter cooling is an essential step in sparking the courtship process for your newt or salamander. Winter cooling is simply putting your newt or salamander through a consistent drop in temperature that simulates the season of winter that they would experience in the wild. However, what winter means for your species of newt or salamander solely depends on the species that you keep. So again, do as much research as you can to find out the appropriate temperatures that you would need to put your animal through. In order to achieve this process, you must slowly start dropping the temperature for your animal. As the temperature drops, your animal's metabolism will drop as well. So at this point, you should start to feed your animal less. And as you near the key temperature that you need for your animal, you should stop feeding altogether 
to ensure that there is no remaining food in your animal's stomach. That way, there is no rotting leftover food. Once you have achieved your key temperature, your animal may stop eating altogether due to their low metabolism. Remember to keep these cool temperatures consistent for at least two months. Once you have cooled your animal for an appropriate amount of time, you can start to bring your animal up to warmer temperatures, and at this point, they will start to eat again. In bringing about these warmer temperatures consistently, your animal should be stirred into breeding mode. And at this point, you should hopefully start to see courtship between your male and your female, and hopefully some successful breeding. So, with all that, how can we actually go about winter cooling? What techniques can we use to make this achievable? One of the most common ways we can achieve winter cooling is placing our animal in a small container and then placing them in the refrigerator. Just remember to set your refrigerator to an appropriate temperature. If you have an aquatic setup, you can place your setup outside in a garage and utilize a small aquarium heater during the winter season just to make sure that your tank does not completely freeze over. This will actually help your animal go through a natural winter cooling process and seasonal change to spring. And so, these were just a few techniques that we could use to achieve winter cooling for our newt or salamander. With that said, remember, every species is unique and has its own requirements to achieve successful courtship and breeding. For breeding to be successful, research is always required and it is always best to learn about the natural habitat from which your animal comes from and their behavior in the wild. And that's the video everyone. I hope that the information provided is useful and I hope that this video helps to promote captive breeding in our hobby. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, comment down below, share the video, get the information out there to more people to help with breeding in our hobby, and best of all, please subscribe, your support is much appreciated. And also, in the description below, there will be a link to my official Facebook page, so follow me for the latest updates. There is much more content to come, I am the Salamander Man.